people. <laughs> That's excellent. Going to turn this sort of side chain. Yeah. It works. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and the, just, does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah, the video. Help you with the, yeah. So it's embedded as it works. I think this microphone's been reasonably good, but it's worth yeah. having it. Yeah, the, the video bit, I might just, you know, it's like I might just. I'm gonna Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It always seems a bit of a shame to stop such animated conversation on occasions like these. Um, but I am absolutely delighted to welcome you, to extend a very warm welcome to each and every one of you to this evening's event. I'm Dilly Fung. I'm the Pro Director for Education at the LSE which for those of you who are not familiar with the strange titles that LSE uses, is the member of the Senior Management Committee who has uh, responsibility overall for student education and the student experience. And it really is my pleasure to be here this evening. So the event this evening is the inaugural LSE lecture by the new director of the Centre for Women, Peace and Security, Sanam Naragi Andalini and it marks the fifth anniversary of the announcement of the centre. And as you will know, because you will have looked at it before you came, the title of the talk is When the Going Gets Tough, Women and the Future of Global Peace and Security. But just before I introduce our speaker, uh, I just have a few general announcements. First of all, um, we do have an online audience and so this event is being live streamed. So a particular warm welcome to those of you who are watching us online. The recording will be posted online afterwards. And for this reason, uh, and for others, we'd really encourage you to silence your phones and uh, anyone wishing to comment on the event, wherever you are, um, do use Twitter. And the hashtag is 
is hash LSEWPS. And we will love to um, follow your thoughts and comments um, during the session and, and obviously subsequently. That would be great. Um, another practical uh, announcement. In the event of a fire alarm, um, everyone must leave the building promptly and make their way to the fire assembly oh. point at Lincoln's Inn Fields, over that side. Um, but of course our event stewards, who are kindly looking after us this evening in the red shirts, um, will lead the way should such an event happen. Let's hope it doesn't. Um, you'll also possibly have seen as you came in that we have students with us who are from LSE RAG, from uh, RAG Week, and they're the fundraising arm of our students' union, and they're raising money for three charities, the Felix Project, Refugee Action, and Doctors Without Borders. So if you are able to spare any change for these worthwhile causes, please do donate, and it would be much appreciated. The event, this event, forms part of the Shape the World series, held in the run-up to the LSE Festival, a week-long series of events taking place from Monday the 2nd to Saturday the 7th of March, exploring how social sciences can make the world a better place. The festival will bring together global leaders, innovators and change-makers to investigate how we can learn lessons from the past, tackle the challenges of today and shape the future. The full programme is now online at lse.ac.uk forward slash festival and the booking is open from the 10th of February so please get booking that would be great um, but now on to the main event of the evening to the specifics of this particular event the Center for Women Peace and Security is a leading academic space for scholars practitioners and policy makers to develop strategies to promote justice human rights and participation for women in conflict-affected situations around the world. Through innovative research, teaching, and multi-sectoral engagement, the Centre aims to promote gender equality and enhance women's economic, social, and political participation and security. And today, the Centre is marking its fifth anniversary. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> So it's an auspicious occasion for us all to be gathering together. Our speaker, Sanam Naragi Andalini, MBE, joined LSE as director of the Centre for Women, Peace and Security in December 2019. Sanam is a globally recognised advocate in the field of women, peace and security, with 24 years experience as a peace strategist, working on conflicts, crises and violent extremism with civil society, governments, and the UN. Sanam is the founder and CEO of the International Civil Society Action Network, ICANN, where she spearheads the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, comprising independent, women-led organizations active in 40 countries, preventing violence and promoting peace, rights, and pur pluralism. Sanam was appointed to the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire, MBE, in the 2020 New Year's Honours List for Services to International Peacebuilding and Women's Rights. So congratulations, Sanam. <laughs> so finally, before I hand over, Sanam will present for approximately 40 minutes after which there'll be time for questions and discussion. So do get your questions lined up. We look forward to hearing them. The event will finish no later than 8 p.m., at which point we warmly invite you to join us outside and join colleagues from the Centre for Women, Peace and Security outside for a reception. So now, please join me in welcoming, welcoming Sanam to the le lectern. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you to the LSC team, uh, Alan Ravel and Zoe at the Center for organizing this, and, and for all of you for coming. Um, I wanted to start with a story for you. It's a story that happened last week, but actually goes back for me about eight years. 
And I want you to start with a scene, which I have for you right here. This is Idlib in Syria. These are people living under olive trees. It's predominantly women and children who are living under olive trees. And they're being bombed. And, and this, this is life right now as we speak. So that's one scene. The next scene, which happened about last week sometime, was a meeting in Geneva where the Syrian government representatives showed up and representatives of the opposition groups showed up and the Russians and the Americans and the international actors showed up. And amongst them, they're all talking about what's going to happen to Syria. And meanwhile, these people are living there and they're being bombed. Um, was one of my colleagues, a young woman called Najla. And Najla was there as part of something called the Civil Society Room, which is now a space or a way in which we have been trying to bring the voices of civilians, women and others, who become peace builders and who do humanitarian work in their own countries. Um, and to have a voice in the formal processes. It's taken us about 20 years to finally have something called a, Syrian, a civil society room that's, that's been applied to the Syria process. And Najla was there and she em emailed me to say, you know, we're there and what do we do? And, and, um, and I said, you know, how's it going? And, and she said, well, I'm here and I've met these people and I'm really trying to tell them about the plight of the people living under the olive groves. And, and I keep saying they're displaced and they need help and so forth. And the UN says to me, yes, we understand. There's nothing we can do, though. And the Russians and others say, yes, of course, we understand. But you know, it's in our national interest what we're doing. So there you have the meeting. They come, they talk, they go away. And Najla and people like her are left to think about and deal with and constantly be concerned about what happens to the folks under the trees that nobody else is looking after. Now, Najla herself is an interesting character. How did she come into my world? In 2012, um, at, at ICANN, we hosted our first sort of gathering of women peace builders from, uh, from the Middle East and Asia regions. And we were in Istanbul, and uh, this young woman arrived. And her face was so traumatized, she couldn't smile. And I remember thinking that if I can just get her to smile in the space of the three days that she's with me, we have made some progress. She came, she met other women peace builders. There were women from Pakistan and Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Tunisia, talking about what was happening. It was, it was in the, just in the aftermath of the Arab revolutions. The Libyans were telling us that the Salafis are coming. Uh, the Tunisians were quite excited at the time. Things were going well for them. The Egyptians were quite happy about things moving forward. But she came and she met women who were active in their own countries. And at the end of the three days, I have this picture of her. She smiled. And she went back, and she was, she'd become a refugee in Turkey. And we saw her th over the next few years. And she, she has now set up a center in Turkey where she basically hosts Syrian refugees who come, women from all sorts of backgrounds who come there. And she's providing them with Turkish lessons and computing skills and livelihood skills. She's taken women off the streets. She was telling us last year that she had one lady who um, has now started a sewing factory and they're making clothes and so forth. Um, so, so over the years, she has now become an activist and that's why she, she ended up being invited to Geneva. But two years ago, she came along and she said, she said, you know, my son is now 17. And he came to me and he said he wanted to go back to Syria to fight with Daesh, to fight the government. And, and I said, over my dead body, you, got, you get to go back to Syria because I didn't bring you out to Turkey for you to go back and die. And the son was absolutely adamant that he wanted to go back and fight. So Najla said to him, if you're going to go back to Syria to join Daesh, I'm going to go with you and I'm going to marry one of those guys and I'm going to become a jihadi bride so I can keep watch over you. He didn't go. It wasn't cool to take his mom along, was it? <laughs> so, <laughs> so then she started working with other women around this issue of what was happening to their sons and so forth. Now, I say this to you not because Najla, I mean, yeah, Najla is pretty unique, um, but, but not that she's the only one out there. In the audience tonight, I have so many of my partners who do exactly this kind of work in their own countries. And whether it's Yemen today or Sierra Leone 20 years ago when I started this work, 
this is a story that keeps happening over and over again, that we have wars that start, people, and especially women, who become involved in peace building, international powers that are involved and are doing so little to actually stop what's happening. And the least powerful are taking on the most responsibility and the most powerful have basically sort of shed their responsibility. We're living in a way in the age of disresponsibility, if, if, if you want. And for me, my work in this, in this area has been to try and understand what is it that we can do and what, what is it that is, what's going on and how do we tackle this? So tonight I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about sort of the global context of why, why the going is getting so tough how women are involved in this space beyond Najla, my own involvement in this, and then, and then what are my reflections having been doing this for nearly a quarter of a century? And, and you can argue you know, whether I've been successful or not is, is also a question up for grabs at the moment, I think. So first of all, globally, we have a problem um, in terms of our international peace and security architecture, and, and I'll sort of limit it to sort of four basic points of, of where we have gaps. First one is a structural gap. We have a UN system, a Security Council system, and as I say, the rules of engagement around international peace and security, which basically says uh, state is sovereign, non-interference is primary. So if a country, if, if a government is bombing its own people, in principle, unless we are invited in, we can't go in to do anything. Now, what's happened is that that was a 20th century architecture, but in the 21st century, basically since the 1990s and onwards, the wars that we're dealing with have been civil wars predominantly. They've started as civil wars and then they've become transnational and, and, and global and so forth. But this, there's a structural gap here that what are we meant to do when we have civil wars brewing and, 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 and emerging? So, so that, that's one thing. The second gap that we have is a credibility gap. Now, those of you who are histories, you know, international relations uh, scholars and others will say, oh, you know, Security Council was always, has always had problems of what it deals with and what it doesn't deal with. But in the current era, in the last 20 years or so, basically the credibility gap has really widened because what we have, the problem that we have is that in 2003, in the run-up to the Iraq War, we went, you know, the US and the UK went to the uh, Security Council. They didn't get the votes to actually launch the war but they initiated the war, right? So automatically you're making the entity that's play, that sets the rules of the game, you're, you're challenging their credibility. So that's 2003. Then fast forward, we get to Libya, 2011 and 2012. At this point, um, there is an agenda called the Responsibility to Protect, protect Agenda, which, is, which was meant to be around trying to prevent governments from attacking their own people. So if they're not protecting their own people, in principle, there's a... There's a uh, onus on the international community to, to engage and try and protect those civilians. So Libya was the story of civilians saying, Gaddafi's coming to kill us, what do we do about this? The problem is that once you have France taking the charge and NATO going in, it was obvious to any of us, and I was, I was working at the UN at the time, that there is no way that you're just going to protect civilians and leave Gaddafi. It would make NATO look ridiculous. So by definition, by going in, it was starting a process of regime change, which was a problem because that wasn't the supposed mandate of, of the mission going in. That was one side of the problem. The second side of the problem was that when they did Libya, when they did go into Libya, instead of learning the lessons of Iraq and actually having peacekeepers go in and trying to have a modicum of security in the aftermath of the failure of the regime, we left a vacuum. In fact, we outsourced the security of Libya to regional powers, to the UAE and to Qatar and to the Saudis and others. And the mess that we have right now with civilians being killed is precisely a result of what's happening. So that was, that was Libya. Meanwhile, Syria was brewing under the surface. And again, I was there at, on the mediation standby team of the UN at the time, watching this, these things and figuring out, you know, what's, what's gonna happen? They kept saying to us, what are, the, you know, what are scenarios? What do you think should be going on? But it was very obvious that the Russians weren't going to allow the same thing to happen in Syria. So the mantra of the UN, which is never again are we going to go to, you know, have this kinds of war, world wars and so forth, the idea of never again was basically sort of destroyed with the Libya process because never again are we saying never again, we're letting these wars happen. Now, and, and then if that wasn't bad enough, we get the Yemen war. And the Yemen war is to me one of the biggest 
moments of the failure of the, of the system. Because if we go back to the original rules of the game, which is that you're not meant to have, the Security Council is meant to stop states fighting each other, right? If that's the rule of the game, why on earth did we allow Saudi Arabia to go and bomb Yemen? Two member states. Now, we can say, oh, the Yemeni government asked the Saudis to come in, but it is still two member states going in after each other. And the problem there is that you now have France, the US, and the UK, three members, three permanent members of the Security Council, actually selling weapons and benefiting from this war. Right? So essentially, and, and if we look now, um, as, as we speak, uh, we have China, Russia, the US, UK, and France as the permanent five members. All of them are somehow implicated in some very nasty behavior. Right? So the Security Council, the UN Security Council, has become the unsecurity council for most of us. And we are looking to the, we, we call them the P5, the permanent five, and then, and then there's a temporary 10 that come and go every two years. So it's really come, become the onus of the, of the other countries that come on board to actually help us build the norms, sustain the norms, um, play by the rules of law and the rules of war and the rules of peace. From the standpoint of women, it's also become even more difficult because now we have a United States uh, government um, that also has a particular issue around sexual and reproductive health. So in the Security Council, if we want to deal with sexual violence in the context of, of war, you know, ISIS d doing, you know, uh, sex trafficking women, we have the US now telling us that, you know, we can't mention these things because, because they have a home agenda and a, and, a, and a domestic constituency that is absolutely obsessed with issues of abortion and, and, and the pro-life movement and, and so forth. So, so you have this credibility gap. The third gap that we have is the complexity gap, which is the, uh, the attitude that we're trying to sort of sort out these wars, you know, Yemen and Syria, and it's like a football game. There's the government and then there's the opposition, right? It's not, it's much more complicated. There are lots of different actors at any given point that are warring actors with proxies and so forth. But there are also peace actors in the middle of all this, which is, again, the women and the youth and others, but predominantly women, women's peace building organizations. When I was at the UN and the Syria issue came on, on, on file and we were sitting and brainstorming, I remember saying to them, well, you know, this is a moment for us to actually think about what Iran is doing and, and, and you know, deal with them in terms of their issues and, and, and have a regional solution. And somebody said to me, ah, oh, you want to make the problem more complicated than it is. And I looked at them and I said, the problem is more complicated than it is. Um, the final approach that they took was a little bit like an advertising sort of, you know, um, billboard. It was, we want to freeze the violence and unfreeze the politics. Sounds really good, doesn't it? It's been eight years and it hasn't worked, right? So, we, so we're not able to deal with complexity very well, which leads us to the last of the gap problems, the vision gap the ability to imagine and do things differently. Einstein and others who said, you know, madness is trying to do the same thing over and over again and, and think you're gonna get a different result. We've been saying that the peace processes need to be more inclusive. They need to bring in the voices of the civilians. They need to bring in the voices of people who care and are doing the work. Um, they need to bring the voices of the multitude of actors and we need to have processes for the design of peace which actually match the reality of the complexity of the war. Right, so it's rethinking some of these things. But there is a vision gap. We're still being railroaded into, you know, oh, well, yes, you want women. Why don't you shove them into this, this uh, you know, delegation of government or this delegation of, of opposition? Or we still get the usual thing of saying, but you know the Houthis in Yemen, they're conservative. They don't talk to women. Oh, you know the Taliban? They'll never talk to women. We know that these guys are always talking to women. In fact, we know women are talking to them all the time. But by, by the time you get it up to the bureaucrats and so forth, there's a, there's a lack of a sort of um, willingness to engage in this. So a couple of years ago, um, one of the organizations in Finland came out with this, with this meme. They said, what do flowers, a paper pad, and middle-aged men have in common? They all have more chance of being at the peace table than women do. Right, this is still true today. So, where does all this come in terms of um, sort of the question of women's involvement in war and peace. Well, for starters, anytime there's war, obviously there are women in, the, you know, in society, they're living with it. Historically, 
the front lines have been somewhere else and the home front has been where women have been. Uh, historically and, and contemporarily, men are the ones who die predominantly. Right? That's, that's, that's just a reality. So women are left to deal with the, with the burdens of these things. One of the things that we forget historically is that women have also been at the forefront of nonviolence um, and conflict transformation movements. We often think of Gandhi and Mandela and, and uh, uh, Martin Luther King, but we don't think about Loretta Scott King, who was actually the, the activist who inspired uh, Martin Luther King with some of her strategies. We don't think about um, who was behind the Nobel Peace Prize. How many of you know of uh, Bertha von Suttner? Just hands up. My, my friends in the, in the yeah. Bertha von Suttner was a peace activist in the, in the early, early uh, 20th century who inspired Nobel, basically. Her name has basically been erased out of the history books, and his name is known. So women have been there, and, and every culture and, and continent you look at, they've been present, but they just haven't been written in, into the histories. But they've always been there, and, and the message of prevention and peace and social justice has been something that, that women leaders have often um, uh, uh, brought to, to the fore. In the contemporary context, so going from, from, from the 19s on, 1990s onwards, because we've had civil wars, the, the war front is now the home front, and women's bodies have become literally the battle line, battlegrounds, right? So if you look at Bosnia and Rwanda, women were being raped as a way of men communicating with each other to say, I'm gonna destroy your ethnicity, I'm gonna destroy your religion, I'm gonna destroy your community. We're gonna, we're gonna make sure that you have children, you know, pregnant girls so that we are actually destroying the bloodline. Right? So, so women's bodies have literally become the front lines of, 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 these, of these wars. Women have also become the first humanitarian responders. That's, that's also something that, that, that we've been seeing. seeing. At the international level, um, in, in uh, 2000, uh, we mobilized globally, and I'll talk about that in a minute in terms of how I was involved in that, to get the first Security Council resolution that actually acknowledged women's experiences in, in war and, and peace, but specifically their, their role that they have in peacemaking and peace building, and the need to have them at the peace table. We were able to get involved and get into the Security Council because the Security Council deals with issues of peacekeeping. And unfortunately, again, going back to the 1990s till today, one of the other challenges that we have is that when we send peacekeepers in, there's sexual abuse and exploitation. So peacekeepers are going in to protect, but they're actually then abusing uh, local women. Right? So this, this issue was something that was very uh, prevalent in the 1990s as a result of what happened in Cambodia where they went in and not only prostitution went up, but HIV AIDS rates went up. And, and the idea of UN babies being all over the place, right? So that, that's another way that, that, that um, we see women being involved. And then, again, also in the 1990s, we saw coming out to, into the international space the role of women as uh, peacemakers and mediators um, in informal processes. So, South Africa and, and Israel-Palestine and Northern Ireland are three of the most prominent cases. In South Africa, very, again, I don't think it's very well documented, but the first people to actually meet publicly across the different, the political spectrum, from, from the ANC movement all the way to, to, to the, across the political parties, were women. It was not easy to meet pu publicly, but they did it. In Israel and Palestine, the first people who came up with the idea of a two-state solution and some of the solutions that to this day are still floating around was Israeli and Palestinian women who work together across the board. Not easy, but they were doing it. In Northern Ireland, again, Catholic and Protestant women came together and they were dealing with issues of childcare and equality and violence, violence in the home, but living in the context of war. And, and essentially, what all these people realized was that the minute you start to talk to each other, you have more in common based on your gender identity as women than the differences that ethnicity or race or, or religion may bring, bring about. And I would posit that if we brought the men and got them to speak about their experiences as human beings, we'd probably find the same thing. But we often don't, we rarely in fact ever do that to allow men from the communities to, to, to talk to each other. So, we have the question of women being involved in wanting to prevent wars and violence. We have them involved in peacekeeping and, and the issue of what happens to women, the issues of protection, and then this idea of 
having the right to participate. And the participation element has two dimensions. One is we should have the right to be at the tables where our future is being decided for us. It's very simple. In the case of Aceh, they, a after um, 30 years of war, there was a tsunami, a six-month peace process was, was, was lined up. They had no women there except for one woman who came in as an expert. One of the things that they did in Aceh was they en enabled the imposition of Sharia law as the constitution and, and the law of the land. That has been so detrimental to the rights of women because essentially it structurally and legally discriminates against them. So, so the peace table and the negotiations that happen and the agreements that happen at the peace table, it's like the blueprint of where we're going. And if women aren't there, God knows how their rights and issues are gonna be dealt with. So that's one side of the story. The second side is the question of the knowledge and the experience and the approaches that, that women bring. And I think that you know, in, in the lingo of, of, of our field, we say it's the efficiency argument. I actually think it's a really important issue because it's really about enabling us to think, how do you engage differently? What does it mean to think about our identities and the experiences and, and what we do? And, and, I'll, and I'll share, you, share with you some of my own experiences. So that's the story of, of, of women. Um, where do I come into all this? And by the way, by this point, I think I've forgotten where my slides were going, but um, yeah. Oh, that's frozen on me. Yeah. Never mind. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute. My involvement. Um, on one hand, I got involved in this at the age of 11 because we had a revolution in Iran, and all of a sudden I became displaced, like many of my friends and family. And you live with that issue of displacement and the trauma and the turmoil of your own country. Um, for generations, it's not a one-off event. I think this is one of the things that you learn, that when you have a civil war or a civil conflict, it is not just a one-off event that you see in the media here, you know, back in 1979, something happened. It goes on forever. Um, the American Civil War, it's still, we're still living with the remnants of it, right? So, so there is a kind of question of a sort of a lifespan of, of uh, these experiences. On the other hand, having arrived here at the age of 11, um, it was a period of trying to, uh, sort of balance between assimilation and alienation. So like many of my English friends, I wanted to do English literature uh, at university, um, but I got drawn to the work of William Butler Yeats and the Irish crisis. <laughs> so, so I you know, got involved in that. Um, I then came out, I wanted to do, I thought you know, I should go and do marketing and business consulting because that's, you know, that's what our generation did in the, in the 1990s. Um, I started that and I was more interested in what the kitchen ladies were saying about their lives and, and how they were helping kids than in selling the product, which was, I don't know, I don't know cake mix or, or, or something like that. And I realized, well, I can't spend my life selling cake mix to people. I need to do something else. I went to do anthropology for my master's, interested in the role of sort of cultural miscommunication and the role of media and how the technology or the medium can be used to pass on a different message. Um, I did that back in the 1990s, and it's interesting to see the fake news stories and others happening now. But um, but again, I got, I got a little bit worried because I thought, well, what am I meant to do with this? And at Cambridge at the time, they, did, they told me this isn't anthropology. So, so I thought, oh dear, I better go off and find another job. Uh, <laughs> I went into banking for a bit, which was, which was an interesting experience. I went to work in a, in very briefly in, in, a, in an investment bank. And, and again, um, while the bankers were getting terribly excited about a Western conglomerate coming into an Asian country to build a big fancy resort, on this beautiful spot, I was looking at it and saying, but this beautiful spot is opposite a really important cultural temple. People are not gonna be happy with, with you know, foreigners running around in bikinis. This is gonna cause conflict. Um, it's gonna cause, uh, so, so I realized that I'm, I don't really have a banker's mindset either. <laughs> um, and then I thought, oh, journalism. And, and I'd always been interested in journalism. So I, so I went off to the BBC and, and the CN, and CNN to work in the newsrooms. And there was a moment in 1994 where, uh, in the CNN newsroom, we had images of Mandela's election in South Africa and the euphoria around that, and at the same time, Rwanda. And I don't know how many of you remember this, but it was literally images of people hacking others to death. And to watch that and think, why isn't it being stopped? Why are we not doing anything about that? And I think those two, that juxtaposition of those two images basically kind of, enabled me to think about what it was that I wanted to do. And I ended up um, joining International Alert, uh, which was a conflict resolution organization, with the idea that how do you stop the eruption of violence 
um, within a country when conflict is real, conflict needs, there are legitimate reasons for conflict, but it doesn't have to get violent. It doesn't have to be a rupture. So the uh, South Africa ideal of how do you transform the relationships so that everybody has their place and their a space and a recognition and legitimacy uh, in their own country. How do you do that for others? How do we get along and, and, and make that happen? And it was a very interesting moment because we were looking at the, the new wars and, the, and part of the work that was going on was this idea of you need to broaden diplomacy, we need to have multi-track approaches, we need to think about the diaspora and, and other groups and, and, and civil society and, and so forth. Along with that was the assumption that ah, if we have early warning, if we know what happens in advance, we can stop these conflicts. What we saw was that that's not true. Actually, knowledge does not lead to action. Knowledge leads to inaction. Knowledge leads to apathy. Knowledge leads to fatigue. So it really, the assumption that someone else is going to come and help you really doesn't hold. And so that was where, for me, it became a question of saying, well, who, will, who on the ground, when things go bad, who on the ground gets involved? And it was women. And it was women, and it was, it was this invisibility of the work of women. So in 1998, we had the first global conference of women in conflict here in London from 50 countries. They asked for global recognition and, and a policy paradigm, which became our mobilization for a Security Council resolution. And what was extraordinary about that, there are many stories about how that happened. And I'm happy to, to share, share with you all the details of what I was involved with. But what was amazing about that was that it was the first time that the voices and experiences of women from around the world came directly into the Security Council. And we, the draft of the resolution that we had came from women on the ground living with these realities. And, and I'll just give you a few of the sort of examples of what was in there that, that came from women. Number one, prevention of war. We talk about prevention in that resolution. It doesn't really exist in any of the other resolutions. Number two, sanctions. Sanctions are now referenced in Security Council resolutions as a way of sanctioning people who've done bad things, sanctioning you know, war criminals. And, but we were talking about it from the other side because of the Iraqi experience. We were saying, you have to look at what sanctions do to the communities on the ground. To this day, this is an issue. In Iran, in Syria, in Yemen, in Gaza, we are using sanctions and it is killing people. So it's a different form of war. We talked about participation of women, of course, and we also talked about the gender dimensions of issues of elections and security and, and disarmament and so forth, meaning you need to think about the differences, different experiences and different needs of men and women as you, as you plan these efforts. But what we really did was we brought the human face of war to an institution that had only thought about it and continues to want to think about it in terms of entities of the state, as if humanity doesn't exist. Because the minute you start talking about women, people are saying, oh, but what about men? What about their experiences? And it's fascinating how that opens up the, the, the space. Um, I have my colleague here who said, you know, why are you talking about women? Why not talk about the widows? Um, and what happens to the, to the widows, young and old, in, in some of these countries, right? In 2008, Again, the Security Council got involved, got interested in, in, uh, in this, these issues, and they said we wanted to deal with sexual violence and conflict. I tried very hard to put in the term men and boys as victims of sexual violence. Uh, it was taken out, taken out by various members of the, country, uh, of, the, of the council at the time. So we put in civilians. We put men and women and girls, that was okay. And we put civilians and people, so gender neutral language to enable men to also be recognized as, as these victims. This, these types of, you know, the lawyers amongst you will know that wording matters so much, but it's such a ridiculous kind of wordsmithing that goes on and, and how people take these, these things out. But essentially, it's, it's been about how do we bring the human face of war into, into, into our institutions. The second thing, the minute we got the resolution, the, the part of the discussion was, ah, but what's the evidence? What's the evidence that women make a difference? What's the evidence that it's going to be better? What's the evidence? Um, I started doing research on this in 2000, and over the years I've done a series of, of multi-country studies. Uh, and I have this to say, the first piece of evidence about why we need to do things differently is because the way we've been doing them just doesn't work. You would not go to a heart surgeon who had a 50% success rate, right? How many of you would go to an endodontist for a root canal with a jittery hand and a 50% success rate? We don't. <laughs> they change their practices. We have, to, we have to start from that point of evidence. But what happens is they want evidence. So over the years, 15, you know, 15 country case studies around how women have contributed. Um, 
in 2008 to 2010, I was looking at the issue of men, and again, again if, I, if I bring this up, it would be fun. Um, I went to look at what happens to young men in countries where there's fragi fragility and violence and so forth. And my conversations with them, with ex-combatants and gang members and sort of people who are on the verge, on the cusp of criminality, was fascinating because I would say to them, you know, how do you, how do you get in? What is it that makes you feel insecure? In Jamaica, the gang members talk, talk to me about how they worry about being asleep at night and having the gang next door come and kill them. The, the uh, ex-guerrilla ex leader in Liberia, when I said to him, what does it mean to be a man? He said, you know, I need to provide. Providing is a big deal for men in, in all these places. I said, okay, so you need to provide. Why don't you go to the market and sell, you know, sell stuff like, like the women do? Because, ah, oh, that's women's job. That's not, that's not for me. I can't. You know, I'm a man. So I said, but you want to provide. How can, you, how can you sit around doing nothing? But this juxtaposition of what it means to be a provider that needs, but it has to be tied to prestige. It can't be just any job. It has to, and he, finally he said, you know, I can grow the peppercorn, but a woman has to sell it. So, so it was this, this question of the nuances. But to be a provider, to have a prestigious job, to be a protector of their families and of their societies. One of the things that Syrians talk about is the fact that as the Syrian war happened, me, you know, families were separated and they weren't allowed to leave together and the men were stuck. Do they leave because they're, because they're being targeted or do they stay with their families? Do you go off and, and try and earn a living abroad or do you stay and fight for your country? It, this issue of protector and warrior becomes, a, becomes an issue. And then the issue of fatherhood and procreation, having children but also being, having that role of, of, of a patriarch. And that varies in, 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 in many places but again, in, um, in Jamaica, I was talking to one chap and, and he was telling me about, you know, uh, how he needs to provide. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, children. He goes, you know, well, I have this girlfriend and that girlfriend and, and they all have children. And I said, well, why do you keep having children? I said, because peer to peer, they need to, they, they basically show their manhood by having more children. Even though it makes them more difficult for them to provide. So there's this crisis of masculinity that happens in, in crisis contexts. But what was also fascinating was that I, in my conversations with these guys, I, I would ask them, what do you want for your children? Many of them have children. And one of these chaps turned around to me, he goes, I want my children to have good education, good table manners, speak well. And my kids were about four years old and I was like, yeah, me too. <laughs> it's, it's really hard. <laughs> but, but it was this conversation about li kind of talking to them about, about people they care about. And this again is something that I think as women, we are good at doing, not because men can't, but because we have to figure out a way to engage on a human level, and when you talk to people about the people they care about, it opens up all sorts of doors. It, it, it's, it's a way of connecting and bonding and, and so forth. So, so, so to me, this, this has been something that I've learned um, a great deal about. So we did the evidence, you know, with ev and, and meanwhile now we have statistical evidence about why if you have women in peace processes in a sustained way, it actually makes the peace better. It makes the implementation of peace agreements more sustainable and, and, and so forth. And one of the elements that comes out is that women um, are good at holding parties accountable, right? And the flip side of that, which is fascinating, is that you will get the Houthi, Houthis and, and the Yemeni government, the Syrian opposition and the Syrian the Taliban and others, in the poll, eight different political parties at each other's throats about everything. The minute you say, oh, we want women at the table, they become a united front. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> wants the women from civil society at the table because they start questioning these guys and they start saying, you don't get it and you don't represent us. So there is, an, there is a fundamental issue of accountability and about legitimacy, which, which is interesting. And yet, as an international community, we haven't really be, been picking up. So we have all this, we have the policies, we have the evidence. Okay, what do you do with all this? Part of this is that we have to share the knowledge because there is such a huge gap, again, between what we know and what's how the systems work and how what people's attitudes are when you say women, peace and security or women at the table or whatever. I've had, I've had Somalis tell me, ah, women's rights, you just want them to, uh, to get divorced and be promiscuous. That's what it's all about. So I say, yes, of course, right? So, so it's, it's really about how do we shift the knowledge around these things? And over the years, we've done endless workshops for the UN, endless trainings, materials, so forth. I've now gotten into the business of making animations and cartoons 
because I was told by, the, by my UN colleagues that nobody reads anymore. Um, and, and so how else do you convey information, complex information, if they're not going to read? But it's an important, it, it, it was an important message and it was an important process because the minute you start to put things in drawing and have to actually imagine it and think, think of the words as being fewer again, if this was working, you would read it, I would be able to show you something. Um, uh, it, it, change, it forces you to think concretely about the reality. Thank you. Am I just being really silly? Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Ah, sorry. Well, we'll, well, we can come back to these later on. Um, so, these are these are some of my chaps in Liberia, and and these are some of the things that that they talked about when they talked about what makes them vulnerable: their own physical insecurity, issues of livelihood. They didn't have the words to articulate their emotions. I don't know who's doing research on this, but. When, when you've been a 14-year-old boy and you've been abducted and you've been forced to fight and you come out of it 25, at the age of 25 and you've only had a gun, um, you don't know how to say, I am angry, I am upset. I, literally, the vocabulary isn't there. So, so for me, this question of literacy and, and how we articulate emotions and, and, and stop being just visceral violence is something. Um, pressures, of, as, I, as I said, of, of social prestige. And then the mental health and the physical health, the trauma that, that, that goes on. This is my little diagram of what happens. So in a normal setting, you might be able to provide and you might be able to be a father and have prestige, but in a, in a conflict setting, their ability to provide goes down, their ability to be a warrior goes up, so it becomes this completely warped sense of, of what happens. Um, and, and the tensions that we see are that, you know, for women, often it's not uh, social progress that puts them out in the front, it's hardship. They have to get out there, right? What do you do if you've lost everything, you've been displaced, and you've ended up in Kathmandu, and the only place you can get a job is in a dance bar. It's not something you want to do, but that's, that's where the money is, right? Um, very often, women are assisting and protecting men in terms of hiding them and, and dealing with them, and yet they don't get, get recognized. And from the men's side, there's a duality of issues, because on the one hand, they need the women. On the other hand, they can't stand being dependent on them. And, and it becomes this issue of transition and tradition. So, so as crisis happens, there is a tendency for men to want to revert back to the traditions and the norms, um, and they're, they're not comfortable with the transition and the changes. Whereas women are coming in and they're having to deal with the transition and the changes, and, and often it opens up doors for them, but they're being pulled back to tradition. So there's like a real issue around the tensions that, 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 that arise between men and the lives of men and women. Um, whoops. We'll come to that in a second. So, yeah, so part this, this question of evidence and, and, um, and thinking about uh, this work. Um, and, and then, I mean, I think this is it. Is my, whoops, no. All right, I'm, I'm losing this. So the animation story, is, it's important because, Sorry to all the folks outside who watch mostly. Um, so this is about ceasefires. We don't think about ceasefires. When violence breaks out, people want it to stop. Ceasefire agreements can make space for discussion. National or international leaders can facilitate talks to stop the fighting. Trusted local actors like the religious community and women leaders can also get involved. There are several kinds of ceasefires. The terms are often used interchangeably. A truce can be a first step to stop the fighting. It is an informal, temporary, often spoken agreement and is often arranged locally. A cessation of hostilities is a declaration of the suspension of fighting. It can be used to start a more formal end to violent conflict. It is usually a written agreement, but it can be provisional and non-binding. A formal ceasefire is a negotiated binding agreement to stop the fighting and help establish a more permanent peace. It can contain the responsibilities of armed actors, mechanisms to ensure that all parties comply with the terms of the agreement and procedures to address violations. Ceasefires can take place at the local, provincial, national or international level. Sometimes ceasefires can be done unilaterally, meaning they are decided by one group. 
Why does gender matter in ceasefire agreements and processes? Women, men, boys and girls experience fighting and its consequences differently. Ceasefire agreements must take these differences into account. During war, men and boys who are non-combatants are at risk of being rounded up, detained or forcibly conscripted or executed. The majority of civilians who are forced to flee are women and children. A humanitarian corridor should be accessible and the food and medical assistance should be relevant to everyone. There should be safe passage for all civilians. Even if weapons are silenced, warring parties can continue to harass civilians by using sexual violence. And this can trigger cycles of vigilantism and reignite warfare. In 2008, by a job. So this is just an example of some of the material that, that we're developing. And what we, what we discovered was that it's not only being used by diplomats in, in different countries right now, in Afghanistan, people are sharing the, these things, but we can translate them into local languages with our partners. So it's, I think it's in Tamil and Sinhalese, it's in, it's in uh, Arabic, it's in Spanish. It's people are able to use these. And part of this, what I realized is that it's really our responsibility to share the knowledge widely so that people on the ground who are living with this reality can also engage and not be, be scared off by the jargon that, of the security community that comes in in the international community. So this is some of the work that we're, that, that we're doing. Um, another part of this is around a gendered analysis of issues. Uh, this is really, really hard to do, but it's something that it's so important because if you don't actually explain from the outset what sanctions are doing to men and women differently or what's happening in Morocco or Turkey, and, and th this is some of the work that, that we started doing, or Yemen, elsewhere, from this human perspective, it gets completely lost out in terms of the policies and the programs that happen on the ground. So the, one of the, we were one of the first organizations that actually looked at the impact of sanctions in Iran and th th thought about it in terms of what happens to pregnant women when they go to hospitals and there's no epidurals, right? It's, it's as basic as that. It's not really hard to do. I mean, it, it's slightly hard to do because it's getting your brain to think about things in a different way, but the, but the idea behind it is not so hard, and yet it's not being done systematically. And if we don't do it systematically, then, as I say, the programs and the, and the, and the funding and everything else that, that we end up uh, dealing with doesn't happen. Um, I'm really bad at this. Oh, so the reason why I'm showing you all this is because I decided at some point that if I'm, if I'm preaching all this to my colleagues in the governments and the UN and others, I have to practice and see whether it's possible. So am I asking them to do the impossible or is it, is it possible? And so in 2011, I, I, was, I joined the standby team of the UN mediation um, experts and we would get sent off to different places. This is, this is us in Somalia, me and my colleagues. And we worked very hard to try and get women into the, this one Somali process, that, and, and they were sort of in this big compound. They would sit and negotiate, and, and you know, sort of, you think that they're just sitting around doing nothing. They're actually doing some serious conversations and, and things. But, um, but we were in this process to see, okay, what, what can you do? And one of the things that I learned was that, yes, it's possible to get the women there. Yes, it's possible to get really strong language in the agreements around their role and, and how we make sure that they have presence in the upcoming bodies and so forth. But if they are not signatories to the actual agreement, if they're not recognized as a formal party, literally the next day, they will get written out. This is what happened in the Somalia process. The next day, all the parties were like, oh yes, yes, we said all that, but really, you know. And the international community was already thinking about Libya and Yemen and, and elsewhere, so they didn't uphold those agreements. So everything that was done, we, it was like going back to zero again. It's, it's like we just kind of go back to, to, to point zero. That was one thing. The second thing that I realized um, there was that they kept talking about power sharing. There's the this is the language, you know, we must bring the parties together and then they'll share power because that's how we're gonna manage the conflict. We're gonna take it from violent to a political setting and, and carry on. But when you have a war that's been going on for 30 years or 20 years, or in this case, uh, a famine that, had, had, that was devastating the country, I kept saying, they want to be Minister of Finance, but what's their responsibility? Why don't we flip the language and talk about responsibility sharing? And then see which of these chaps who has often three passports in his pocket wants to be Minister of Justice and wants to be Minister of Health and wants to be Minister of Finance. 
because it's an enormous burden to take on of a country that's been devastated. But if we keep talking about this as about power and prestige, and then you're minister, and, and then we honor you, and then you get to fly here and there and everywhere, um, of course, lots of not very savory characters are interested in, in taking those jobs up. So, so this shift of us in terms of how we think about the, the, these roles, I think, um, is important. Then, um, along with these work, we, we, uh, we realized very early on also that women who become peace builders need community and they need a network and they need solidarity because it's very lonely work. It's very often work that your own family doesn't want you to do because it's dangerous work. And so, so over the years we've created, as, as, as you heard from Dili, uh, a network of, of activists now in 40 countries. Some of them are here tonight, so, so I hope that they get to speak as well. But it's, it's been fascinating to, to create this sort of family all around the world um, and with WhatsApp and so forth, it's very easy to stay in touch. Uh, in, in last Easter, when, when the bombs went off in Sri Lanka, I woke up in Washington and I looked at my WhatsApp list and my colleagues from South Sudan, who were devastated by war anyway, were wishing our colleagues and friends in Sri Lanka well. And that issue of just caring, just thinking about each other as human beings and asking how's your family doing and, and so forth makes such a difference. So that's something that we've tried to do. We've tried to, we've set up a fund because we were told that it's really hard to get money to local women's organizations in war zones. So we said, well, you know, hold my coffee cup, let me try this. And so in the last five, six years, with the help of DFID and, and the government of Canada, Norway and others, we've managed to distribute about $2.5 million and shown what can be done when you do small grants into the right hands at the right time in, in a different way, right? We don't need to be, I don't need to be present everywhere. The, our, these people are there and, 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 and this is what's happening. So where are we now in terms of my concluding thoughts on all this? Um, number one, we cannot do any work right, without thinking about identity at the center of it. The problems that we're dealing with right now in the world are inherently tied, or people are inherently using visceral identity, race, faith, ethnicity as a way of mobilizing, as a way of dividing, as a way of justifying violence, as a way of justifying discrimination. So we can't think about politics and geopolitics without thinking about that. And gender is fundamentally front and center of all this, right? I was talking to my colleague from, from, the, from uh, the Maldives recently and from Libya and elsewhere, extremist groups that we see, whether, whether they're white right in the States or whether they're, they're, they're jihadi types that, you know, ISIS and Al-Shabaab, they have an issue with women. They want to suppress and use and exploit women. So when you see a movement coming in and saying, we're gonna start female genital mutilation, we're gonna reduce the age of marriage to nine, we're gonna take girls out of school and allow them, you know, to, as they say, to be married off to older men and, and forget about civil laws, this tells you something. Something is happening, they have an issue with the status of women. So we cannot think about any of the work, whether it's violent extremism, whether it's our humanitarian work, whether it's migration development without thinking about this, these issues of identity and, and, and gender being very centrally to that. Um, second thing, we, sh we tend to fetishize and infantilize women. So we say, oh, they're victims and they need our empowerment, wherever they need our empowerment. Honestly, I think Afghan women are far more courageous and empowered than most of us in this room, but forever we're trying to empower them and, and train them. Um, and and we, we tend to kind of assume things about them, right? That, oh, you know, if they're doing peace work, it's essentialist, we're being essentialist about, about women who are doing peace work. Uh, if they're covered, you know, are they really, you know, out there for, you know, are they real strong feminists and do they get women's rights? These two ladies, um, I met them in Erbil a few years ago, one is Turkmen, one is Sunni. Um, they are widows and they were hiding Iraqi Shia soldiers from ISIS. And then they were going looking like that as, as little old ladies. They were going up to the checkpoints and telling the young men off for their mistreatment of civilians. Saying you shouldn't be doing this and you should. And they were using their identity as mothers, as older women, covered up, whatever, to basically open up passage for people to get through. And by the way, they saved these, these, these Shia soldiers to get back to Baghdad. So um, let's not make assumptions just based on what people look like and how they dress and, and, and so forth. And I have my own many, many stories about, about some of these things. 
I found it myself. Um, I've been in places where I've walked into the room and people have said, oh, you, didn't, you don't look like what we thought you'd look like. Um, I've been in places where they've come to me at the end of a meeting and they, or in the middle of a meeting when I've mentioned that I have children and they're like, you're a mother. Ah, now we can relate to you. Because up to that point, I was some you know, foreign entity they couldn't relate to, right? I've been in places where they've seen my Allah and they said, you're Muslim. And you know, that's, that's been the point of connection. Um, I was in Afghanistan and I was having a conversation with a group of men they were being terribly polite for a whole hour and um, talking about the peace process and what's happening and, and, and so forth. And, and finally I said, well, what do you guys, what do you think about what should happen? And one of them looked at me and goes, you're little, but you know things. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 you know, I was like, that's interesting. So, so they've, been, you know, they've been very nice to me, but, but clearly for a while they were like, who is she? And what, but, but it was this willingness to sit and listen and engage. Um, and, and essentially to find the empathy and the humanity in the other. This to me has been fundamentally important in the, in the work that we do and I wish that we could see this more in, in, in our peace processes, to actually talk to, and I've had this conversation in Oslo once with, with Taliban, what do you want for your children? We had a two hour conversation about what do you want for your kids and, and unpacking all the, all the stuff that, that goes on. So, so that's, that's uh, one, another. So the third, um, the, the fourth point that I wanna make is that we are stuck in a global system which is very much sort of framed around what we don't want. We want to prevent violent extremism. We want to prevent terrorism. We want to prevent conflict, right? But we don't actually say, what do we want? Why is it okay to constantly think of countries in Africa or the Middle East or Asia or, or Latin America as places where we just don't want them to go back to war? It's like, let's just keep it really at that level. Why can't we anticipate and say, what do you want? What's the, what's the positive piece that, 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 we, that we should be looking for? And, and I think that what I've seen in my work, going back to my original four gaps, is that the women peace builders that I work with and who emer emerge in all of the conflicts that, that arise, number one, structurally, remember when I said there was those four gaps, structural and, and so forth, the structural gap. By having the Security Council resolution, and now we have 10 of them, we're closing that gap. We've gone in and we've said, you know what, your system is this, but look, we're coming in and we're trying to broaden it out. So let's create a new model of how we can be inclusive and bring the voices of peace actors and, and recognize that there's agency um, and credibility and legitimacy in people who don't pick up weapons to be at the table. Because otherwise the logic is that Afghan women should be armed to the hilt, extremely violent, and then we'll invite them to Doha or wherever, right? So we have to, we have to reframe that and think about but that, that, that gap. But we have 10 Security Council resolutions that actually on paper do that for us. We're just not doing it uh, on the ground. The second is, um, I said the question of credibility and trust. When you look at how women are involved in humanitarian work and relief work and dealing with communities at a local level, they have credibility and trust that none of us have. They have access that none of us have. That's extraordinarily important when you, when you think about how localized conflicts are, right? And how individualized it's become. Uh, violence has become entrepreneurial. It's the brother and the brother working together on a, on a bus bomb. So who has access to that, right? So women peace builders in communities have that access. The third is the complexity thing. Do you remember the, that, that was the third one? The, the, so this ability to balance, for example, the issue of you need justice in the aftermath of war because there have been horrific abuses people need to be recognized and, and we need to know what happened to the disappeared and, and so forth and, and bring people to justice. On the other hand, you can't just say, oh, we're gonna take everybody to court and we're gonna throw everybody in jail because it doesn't happen like that, right? Whether we, as much as we would like to put every rapist in DRC or in Libya or wherever in jail tomorrow, they don't have the court proceedings. Even in this country, in America, we don't have it. So we have to think about justice in a different way. We have to broaden the idea of justice and think about social justice. What about how are we dealing with providing the health care or the education for the girls who are abducted and want to come back and go to school? That's, that's another form of justice. Why do they have to stay, get stuck in their victimhood all their lives because of something that happened to them at the age of 12? So com that complexity. We have to think about reconciliation. At the end of the day, whether it's Iran or whether it's Syria or whether it's Libya or Sri Lanka, it's one country, one people, we have to learn to live together, right? And
and that requires some level of acknowledgement and some level of reconciliation and, and, and some level of being reflected and respected in terms of the stories and the histories that you bring to the table. And I would say that's not just in conflict areas, I would say that's something that in Europe we're dealing with right now as well, that when you have generations of kids that have grown up but have a different background, they need to be acknowledged in the history books and so forth. Say, why are you here? You know, your parents came from Pakistan three generations ago. Why are you here? What did you bring to the table? How did they contribute to this culture and, and, and so forth? So that complexity is, is, is really um, uh, is important. And then frankly, the vision, the vision question, right? That we are looking forward and, and building the future. And, and for me, the issue is, do we let the past define the future? Or do we look at it and say, what's the future we want? And work backwards to the present and then work towards that, right? So, so rethinking and realigning how we, how we anticipate these things. Um, and then finally, with, the, with, the, with this world that we have right now in terms of, this, of the systems and structures, you know, it's easy to say, oh, the UN system is a disaster and, and it's not working and, and so forth. But actually, if you think about it, what's happened is that the big powers have lost their credibility, but the institutions still matter. Last week, Gambia won a court case against Myanmar in the International Criminal Court for Justice, right? They, and they won because they took them to court for genocide. Now, we, you know, again, we can say it's a legal win, and who knows what's gonna happen, but the fact that little old Gambia gets to take Myanmar. Nobody else did it. No other big state did it. Okay. That's important. The fact that Switzerland was mediating or in, was an intermediary between US and Iran in January stopped what, what was gonna become a regional war, if not a world war. Okay. The fact that Norway has been so involved in so many con conflicts but behind the scenes doing track two and track one work. Little powers matter. And I think that this is the era where the little powers in the UN system are gonna have to come and step up to the plate and be the moral powers that, that, that we need. So that, that's something that, I, that, I, that I'd like to see. And, and with that, I would actually, it's not a little power, but it's the EU, because the EU itself is a role model of how we figure out how we live together, even though we used to have histories of war together. So, so we need to think about these new actors and these new voices coming into the, into the system. And secondly, we need to understand, and finally, finally, 20, I mean, and for me it's been 24 years, I really hope that by the 25th year, things would have changed radically. But we need to recognize that when a crisis happens, communities, people, individuals stand up. Not everybody, but those who do are extraordinary human beings. And we need to support them. And they need to be acknowledged in, if not the same, you know, in far more, if you want, far more sort of with, much, with far greater respect than, than the respect that we're showing the armed groups. So this, this shift needs to happen, but it's, it's really about what I said from the beginning, who is taking the responsibility with, with, and, and who has the power and elevating those who are responsible and diminishing those who think that they can hide behind the power of guns and the power of, of bombast and, and, and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna end there and, and, and I'm sorry about all the mess up here, but uh, it's, it's okay. <laughs> years of the resolution as we've seen it in the last three years. So, um, it's been huge for all of us. Well done, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Sorry Come about and join that. me. Thank Come you. and join me. Um, Thank you so much. That was such a compelling presentation. Um, time is relatively short for questions, so I think we're going to go straight to you. I hope you've got some questions lined up. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take three questions in a batch and then invite Sanam to give us a nice succinct answer so i would really appreciate it if your questions could be questions and also if they could be um really succinct uh, that would be fantastic so um person in the middle over here please wait for the microphone and please if you would be so kind as to just a bit further back in the green thank you um and if you could um uh speak right into the microphone when you do get the microphone and uh, also say who you are, um, that would be fantastic. We've got a uh, um, person here, in fact, two people here. Have we got more mic mics coming up? So have we got, how many mics have we got? 
We've got two. Okay, so can we get one microphone over here ready for, for the next round? Thank you. If we could start with our first question. I'm Margaret Owen, Director of Widows for Peace Through Democracy in Salam. Brilliant, and thank you. I've just got two questions. One is, we're seeing a world where more and more right-wing populism, sovereignty, nationalism, and the only thing that people will talk about when we try to make governments accountable are sanctions. And as you said, sanctions hurt the most vulnerable. What else is there? And my second question is how important it is to have more women in leadership and couldn't we somehow copy the Kurds and have co-chairs, men and women, at every possible decision-making committee from the top to the bottom, including the army? Those are my two questions, but thank you for everything you said. Thank you very much for those questions. Thank you. We'll take one more question over here, if we, if we may, and uh, then, and then uh, we'll just have the answer to those, because that was three questions, really, and then we'll come to some more of you. Yeah, thank you, um, thank you very much. Um, the name's Ewan Grant. I'm a former law enforcement intelligence analyst. I've worked in Bosnia, Somalia, Yemen, and on the Jordan-Syrian border. Um, I saw a, in Bosnia the great resentment of the European Commission staff against the United States. The resentment was because it was the American bombers going in that ended the war. They were resentful because they couldn't do it. Um, my question is, um, how easy is it to work with uh, peacekeepers, be the UN or otherwise, because I have to say I found generally um, humanitarian and development workers don't actually like soldiers. Um, regarding Northern Ireland, um, perhaps the orphan children of Mrs. McConville would take a slightly different view about the role of women in peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. If I can, could, could you just pass that microphone to the person behind in the, in the next row and we'll line up um, one more question. Uh, over at the back there with a the hand raised, could we have the other microphone over there? Thank you very much. That's right. Be bold. Raise your hand so that we can see you very clearly. Just giving you some thinking time for now. So, would you like to uh, respond yes. to those first questions? Do you want me to? Um, I'm going to take the question of the, uh, you know, the sanctions and, and, and so forth and say, you know, it sounds really simple, but we need people to start talking, talking. I mean, how is it that, that it's allowed, you know, and again, I, I, January 7th, when, when the Iranian missiles went into Erbil and, and we were all watching to see whether this was war, there is a, there is a certain kind of, I don't know how, how to say this, but we were being emotionally blackmailed because on Twitter and in social media, got both sides, the, the Americans and the US uh, and the Iranians, were saying, we're gonna come and bomb you know, 52 cultural heritage sites in Iran. And the Iranians were saying, we're gonna come and uh, you know, bomb Haifa and Dubai and, and so forth. Behind the scenes, they were talking. From the, from the minute Soleimani was killed, there was messages going back, don't escalate. Right? So why can't they do this in public? Why is it that we have world leaders who are hiding behind bombast in public? And, and coming to your soldier's point, why is it that they are hiding behind soldiers? Right? They are sending the military and your boys and our boys and boys and girls, I should say, to pursue their political agenda. This, this, this to me is what's, what's, what's shocking. In America right now, we have something like 20 active servicemen and women and vets, but 20 people from the services a day committing suicide. Committing suicide because they're not getting the support that they need from their government, the government that sent them to Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. Right? This is abominable. This, this is, so, and, and, and coming to your point, sir, about you know, how do we work with these, I found, and I've certainly found in the countries that I've worked and my colleagues worked, that we have, as, as frontline peace builders and people living in these communities trying to change things, we have more in common with the military than we have with politicians. 
frankly, because the military gets it. They're there, and the women are there. And they're living with the bombs coming in. So, so, so we have much more in common in terms of the conversations and about what needs to be done. And, and to constantly see the military being used to pursue a political end that is never going to happen. It's just, so, so I think that this is, this is, you know, they need to sit down and talk. You know, hashtag real men talk. Strong men talk. I don't know, big men talk. <laughs> sit down and talk, right? It's, that's, that's, that's what I would, um, that's what I would say. So um, on the question of, of peacekeepers, again, as I said, we have no, I have never had an issue in terms of dealing and engaging with the military, and I know a lot of the women that I work with are, are doing the same things. I think one of the things that we need to acknowledge is that when we have UN peacekeepers going out, if they are abusing local women and girls, this is, this is a horrific thing that's happening at the local level, but it's also completely, uh, you know, defeats the purpose of having the UN there to protect people, right? And, and the answer, again, if we had 100% female peacekeepers, chances are sexual abuse would be pretty much zero, right? So maybe we should, we should start all women peacekeeping forces, except that the money is good in peacekeeping, so, so that's part of the reason why the, why the, the jobs aren't being made open to, 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 to women. So, so that, that's one thing. Same goes with the question of women in leadership and, and so forth. For years, you know, when, when the Kenya election violence happened, Kofi Annan went in with Grasa Michelle, and it was, a, it was a dual kind of leading the mediation effort. I've been saying for years, why can't we have dual mediation teams for Syria, Yemen, et cetera, et cetera? If not that, why not use the 20th anniversary of 1325 and have all women leads? <laughs> why not? I mean, you know, in terms of whether it's Yemen or Syria, you know, any of the, Libya, it, it, it's... What, what would happen if we actually appointed incredibly qualified? Again, it's always this question of, are the women qualified? And, and I'm always questioning that I've met many men who have high, who have high positions, and they're not, they're great, but they, it's not, qualification is not necessarily one of their attributes. So, so let's, let's, flip, <laughs> let, let's flip some of these things around and, and open it up. Um, but but that, that question of, we need to think about things differently. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. So um, I'll guess here. Thank you for the beautiful presentation. Um, my name is Jen. I work with the Archbishop of Canterbury's Reconciliation Ministry. And you did mention of power sharing stroke responsibility sharing. I know this is a very common um, issue that comes in conflict countries, usually when negotiations are going on the question of power sharing and responsibility sharing doesn't usually come up, but power sharing is key. And yet when you look in conflict countries, as you did vividly mention, it's usually women and children who bear the brand of conflict. And so how can we as women um, um, work together and see that the responsibility of power share, responsibility sharing is carried out effectively in conflict countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. And we'll take the other yeah. question yeah. from the um, person with the Following microphone. from the question on women in leadership, um, how can we make Could sure that- Could you just introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Paulina. I work at the ODI Overseas Development Institute. It's a sustainable development think tank here based in London. Okay. Um, my question relates to women in leadership and how we can make sure that women not only have a seat at the table, but actually have real voice and are taken seriously when they're at the table. Thank you. Thank you. So two connected questions, I think. Would you like to take that? Yeah, so um, in terms of, again, the way that in, in my work, one of the things that, I, that I've been trying to raise, and, and it's something that we're now doing much more systematically, is to say, I'm interested in women who have taken who have had the courage and have taken on the responsibility of being peace builders or engaging in these issues on the ground, right? Whether it's mediation, whether it's relief work, whether it's uh, release of detainees, you know, I mean, doing, doing things that are relevant to the process of peacemaking. Those women need to be recognized for their agency and they need to be independent delegations at peace talks because it's only if they are independent delegations that are there, can they see it through entirely? Can they, can they hold other sides accountable, can they be signatories to continue the process as it goes on, right? 
So that, that issue of independent delegation of women peacebuilders, we can talk in detail about how we cri what criteria and so forth. But again, we set the bar really, really high for people like that. For the men, it's if you have a gun and you are violent, and if you're super, super violent, at some point we're going to come and talk to you and invite you. Right. So, so let's let's recalibrate um, uh, that issue. Um, the question there was about specifically um, about. How we can make sure that women oh, not only have a seat at the okay. table, but they also have okay. real voice and leadership. So, so I, th I think it's not just about having voice. I mean, personally, it's not just because there, there are lots of women who are there and they have voice. And, and, and in fact, what we're seeing more and more is that the right-wing populist groups that somebody was mentioning right now, um, they've been really good at bringing women in. Look at America, right? I mean, we, we, they're, they're very good at, at having the window dressing and then having women be the voices of pushing back against rights and, and, and so forth, or, or pushing for violence. So, so as far as I'm concerned, again, what I'm interested in particularly is how do we get, how do we enable women to feel comfortable, and, and not just women, I, th I think people, but to say, we're gonna bring a different perspective. Why, why is it that we're just interested in military and political leaders when the conflict has become societal? Where are our doctors? Where are the teachers? And that's all of a sudden opens up the, the space for men and women who bring these perspectives to the table, right? So, so I, th I think, I think that, that's something that, that's very important. I would say um, that I see a generational dimension to some of these issues around women's voice and, and, and space, which is that if you go back two generations, it was about just literally having access to education or being in the, in the places. That, then it was about, okay, we, you know, we're gonna look like the men and be like the men and get ourselves in. My generation, we were like, well, we're in here, we wanna do things differently, right? Um, and, and the way I explain it is, is that equality, if, if, I was, if, if our agenda or this work was just about equality, then I should be happy when we say, oh, we're gonna, you know, as they did in America, where they said, women can now be combat soldiers alongside men. That's an equality agenda, it's an equal opportunity agenda. It's somebody's agenda, that's great. My agenda is not, is not quite that. My agenda is that I, I want to stop the idea of war and violence, so that neither our sons nor our daughters have to go to war. So that's the equality agenda that I'm after, but it's a transformative agenda. Thank you very much. Some more hands up. Um, person over there near the, near the mic, and um, one question down here. Sorry, you're, you're moving, moving. I do, do hold your hand up high. Um, can I just, can I identify the mic to come back to those two people? Thank you for waving um, afterwards. That would be great. Thank you very much. So where were we first? Wave at me. Thank you very much. Um, Leslie Abdella. Um, first of all, many congrats, uh, Sanam. I agree with pretty well all your analysis, um, which is what's going to take me to my question. Just to credentialize, um, I've worked for about 35 years from a worm's eye for you, perhaps, in... Kosovo, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Sierra Leone, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Aceh. Um, and I think taking your vision thing and, and being very practical, and I am not saying any old women and any old men, I want to put that in context, but I'm saying that one of the biggest difficulties I think right now is getting women through the door at the top level peace talks. We've talked about it, not for our generation only, but look back at the end of the First World War, they were trying to get through. And it's no different, the format. So my question is, why are we not using one of the strengths we have, which is to say to the international community, no peace talks should be funded unless there are at least 40% women and at least 40% men at the top tables. I know then you go into, we want to get the right people there, but if there is at least that framework to get, you've got mediator networks of women now who are qualified, but they're not getting through the door. We wouldn't stop people having peace talks, but, we, but the international community pay for the transport, the hotels and all the rest of it. You know that better than me. You are in the official sides. But it seems to me so simple, as the meerkats would say, simples. But you know, you know the UN system better than me. How do you achieve that? It doesn't seem that difficult to me. Thank you for that apparently simple question, which you can come to in a moment. Um, and our next question was over here. 
Um, I'm Cyrus Larizade. Um, I happen to be your cousin. <laughs> <laughs> we go back a long way. I'm a big fan. Um, but I'm also a child protection lawyer, and I deal with very traumatized children. I happen to question them often in court. Uh, and uh, I saw all the slides um, of these extraordinary women and um, resilient women, fighters, um, people that have survived. Um, I do wonder, um, because they are obviously very traumatized, many of them, and you have worked with um, a range of highly traumatized people over 25 years. And um, I'm not asking specifically um, whether you suffer from vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, but members of your team and others in this room, including myself, um, do suffer from um, the impact of secondary trauma. Um, how do you deal with it? Um, how do you cope? Thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to the UN question later. <laughs> That's a hard one. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so I'll tell you my own journey, and, and I was 26, 27 when I started this work, and I went, I, my first day I I'm, walked into an office, and my colleague was a Hutu from Rwanda who had fled the genocide. And I spent two years reading the human rights reports from Bosnia and the issues of what was going on in the camps and the rape camps and, and so forth. Um, I had horrific nightmares. Um, I was, we were, my colleagues were working on Burundi. I was, you know, it was, so it was, it was very much internalized for, for a long time. I, I think I lost quite a lot of friends at some point because they were all working in the city. And, and so, so your world becomes bifurcated in, in, in some ways. What I did find and, and what I have found in terms of the strength is that the reason why I became interested in the work that women do is that having met them, there are often times when I think, I don't know if I could do what they do. That, that's always an, a question, but if this happened to me, I don't. And, and it's, it's an ongoing issue because, because we have colleagues who've lost relatives even last year. Right? So, but what, what, we, what I found is that in the collective, you get a lot of support. And, and, that's, so, and, and the collective, I mean, in our global network. Once a year, we get together, and, and it's become a, a touchstone for all of us to be able to just hug and, and be there, and we will analyze, we will laugh, we will cry, we will do all sorts of things, and we will plan and strategize and move on, but it's almost like your energy goes up, you get, and, and so, so that issue of solidarity is extremely, extremely important. Um, in terms of my own team, some of them are here, uh, we had to have team meetings to say, how do we, what do we do? Because part of our problem is that when you sit, when you sit in a safe place, living in America or here, and you hear all the stories, you feel as if you need to do something, but, the, but there, and you feel terribly guilty about the fact that I'm not living with, so, so how do you deal with that guilt is part of, uh, part of the issue. But it's now become part of our own conversations around how we, how we cope. And I have to say that I have my co two of my colleagues, uh, Stacey, who's in, the, who's in the audience, who's a uh, trained social worker, we've started doing programs on the ground for our partners around psychosocial health care for themselves and for the people they deal with. We have had in instances where we had Nigerian colleagues who do psychosocial care and therapy doing um, Skype calls with Somali colleagues who lived through the, the bombs. It doesn't cost anything, but the fact that we knew everybody. And so, so it's these creative ways of, of bringing these issues up. But more, more importantly, it's we need mental health to be part of the process. And, and, I, and I'll, I'll end with this. Uh, uh, we were um, at a meeting around the question of Commonwealth women mediators a couple of years ago, and, and I was asked to speak about these things. And I said, you know, the, the assumption, this idealistic assumption that people come to the peace talks and they're terribly rational and, and it's all about interests. You know, once we, once we figure out that, you know, you just want that glass of water and I just want it in the afternoon and you wanted to, we, you know, we're going to sort this out. That rationality is, is absurd. People are not rational. There's a lot of emotion. And, 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 it's, and, and we had some colleagues from South Sudan and, Sudan and they said, we're all traumatized. We're at the peace table, but we are all traumatized. We need care. Right? So, so this is something that really does need to be addressed. And, and, and we have to be thinking about it. For, for people who are frontline carers, for people who've lived through the war, um, and of course for, the, for, the, for people who are direct victims of, of violence. Thank you. On Thank the you. UN, 
<laughs> a simple question. Mm. What do we do? Um, you know, I've come to the conclusion, and, and I know we're being live streamed, so this is going to live on the internet forever and ever. Um, <laughs> you know, we have tried to do it by offering ideas and recommendations and engaging and so on. I've come to the conclusion that, that part of this is what are the, there, there is no punitive dimension to not implementing these resolutions. Right? There's no, nothing happens to anybody, it's, it's like a cafeteria approach. That you know, yes, the salad bar is there, but you don't have to eat from the salad bar, you can keep eating your potatoes and your pancakes, right? So, so it, it's this question, what's the cost of not doing it? What is the cost of not engaging of not having a gender analysis of the conflict and the issues? What is the cost of not having and engaging women on the ground and doing this? I've worked with people who came back from places and I said, did you, you know, here, here were the women, what happened? They were fine. I said, where are the notes from the meeting? No notes ever taken, erased completely. That's just not okay, right? So it's not that it's, and as I said, the reason why I have gone inside these institutions is to say, I'm on the outside, I can say lots of nice things about what should be done. What's it like to be on the inside? I've been on the inside, and it's doable. If I can do it, lots of people can. Yeah. So, so that, that's my general mantra. It's like I've practiced, and, and it's possible. And, and, and you know, I always say that we have a challenge of the AAA syndrome of ad hoc practice, amnesia, and apathy. These three things prevail. Over the years, we have had incredible incremental developments, foundational work, incredible people who have moved things along. But we need to move to the sort of three C's, if you want, of commitment, consistency, and care. People have to care about this stuff. When they care, things move radically. And then they leave and somebody else comes and maybe they don't care as much and then it disappears. So that, that can't happen. So, so that's the sh these are some of the shifts that we also need to see. But what's the cost of not doing it? That, that, that would be a good question to, to put to our UN colleagues and our government colleagues and others. Snam, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you here. And with apologies to those of you who were still wanting to ask questions. For all of you, please join us for the reception. And those of you who are waiting to ask questions, please come, um, you know, be the first to speak to Sanam over, a, uh, over something to drink. But please join me in thanking Sanam for her <laughs> wonderful contribution. Engaging. Like, I don't know nobody minded at all. <laughs> Let's go have a drink. Mm.